All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA. And welcome to everybody for our uh, webinar as part of the NPA webinar series that we conduct with the EDM Tools Network and Open Channels. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I especially want to thank our speaker today, Carly Herring, who is the research coordinator for NOAA's Marine Debris Program. And she is going to be talking about microplastics. And I'm going to introduce uh, Carly in just a moment, but I just want to remind you all of the format of today's webinar. You're going to hear the presentation from Carly, and then we will have a plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end of this webinar. So I encourage you to go ahead and type in your questions as you think of them as we go through the webinar, and we will be sure to get to as many of them as we can after Carly's presentation. So Carly, welcome. Happy to have you. Um, like As I said, Carly is the research coordinator at NOAA's Marine Debris Program. She has a master's in science, environmental sciences from the Marine and Estuary and Science Program at Western Washington University. And she has a uh, bachelor's degree in marine science from the University of Maine, where she conducted marine debris research, uh, dealing specifically with plastics in the ocean. So her work experience has focused on marine science education. And as the research coordinator, which she now serves, she is responsible for overseeing research projects funded by NOAA's Marine Debris Program, staying up to date on the literature, and uh, involved in the monitoring and assessment of marine debris. So I will turn it over to you, Carly. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today on microplastics. And thanks for everyone for listening in. So go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a brief Marine Debris 101. Uh, we'll kind of start with the big picture of marine debris and then narrow in on microplastics. I'll give you a brief overview of the NOAA Marine Debris Program and how we're addressing the issue. I'll talk about a few of the microplastic research projects we're funding, our current research priorities, and then make sure to leave some time at the end for questions. Okay, so what is marine debris? Um, you can read the definition here, but I like to think of marine debris um, as more of an issue that's relatable via photos. So the photos up top here represent kind of the expanse of the marine debris issue. So on the far left, we have um, some of the largest debris that we deal with, which is abandoned and derelict vessels. We also have debris that includes like derelict fishing gear, fishing lines, derelict pots and traps. We have consumer products such as plastic bottles, plastic bags, and other single-use um, plastic items. And then we get down to the small, uh, tiny microplastics that we're going to focus on today. And uh, I'll make sure and give you more information on that in just a few slides. A few other points with marine debris that I'd like to point out. This is items that are manufactured or processed, so it's human-made items, and it's getting into the marine environment or the Great Lakes. Okay, so plastics are a very common form of marine debris in the ocean, um, and once these plastics enter the ocean, they're essentially non-biodegradable. Uh, Jenna Jambeck and her group estimated that there are about 8 million metric tons of plastic that entered the ocean in 2010, and that was due to mismanaged waste. And as these plastics enter the ocean, they'll eventually start to break down into smaller and smaller pieces, what we call microplastics. And they break down due to UV radiation, so sunlight breaking them down, making them brittle, and also um, mechanical wave exposure. So you can just imagine plastics being tumbled against a beach or against rocks and how it starts to fragment into tinier and tinier pieces. So we define microplastics as plastic pieces smaller than 5 millimeters in size. And they can come from a number of different sources. So we've kind of broken them into primary and secondary micro, um, microplastics. Sorry, uh, Primary microplastics would include the microbeads that you'd find in your toothpaste or face scrub. Um, it could also include the pre-production plastic pellets uh, that are then used to make other plastic items. We also have secondary microplastics, and these occur when larger plastic items, like those plastic bottles or plastic bags, uh, break down into smaller pieces. Um, we also have microfibers. This is a pretty hot topic right now in the marine debris world. 
And these are either synthetic or natural materials, so wool, cotton, or synthetics, so your plastics, um, that are entering the ocean from a number of different ways. Uh, one of the major ones from our clothing that we wear and then wash. Um, they can also be transported via the air. Um, and they can also break down from other items that are already in the oceans, like ropes and nets um, from fishing gear. With microplastics, the main concern is the ingestion by animals. So as we get to the tinier and tinier pieces of debris in the ocean, they become available for more organisms to ingest. Um, and I'll specifically talk about some of the physical and chemical impacts of marine debris in just a bit. So we briefly covered uh, the types of debris. So you can see here there's a number of sources of marine debris. So microplastics could break down from any number of items that enter the ocean from the list on this slide. And again, as we said, they can be washed down the drain from your face and personal care products, um, as well as through the laundry and wastewater system from your clothing. Here are a list of impacts from marine debris to animals in the ocean and Great Lakes. With microplastics, we're mostly focusing on the ingestion. Okay, so as I was creating this presentation, I was started thinking about what do we actually know about each of the sources and the impacts from different types of debris. So I kind of wanted to start again looking at the bigger items and working our way down. And what patterns do we see? So if we start with our abandoned and derelict vessels, um, we know that oftentimes these vessels are abandoned or neglected by their owners and become uh, derelict. They can also um, be impacted by storms, which causes them to sink or become derelict. We know the impacts are generally due to ha habitat damage, and they also cause um, some sorts of navigational hazards as well. As we work our way to slightly smaller gear, such as derelict fishing gear, Again, we know pretty well the known sources as well as the impacts. This is often due to the death or injury of marine organisms from entanglement or ingestion, ghost fishing, there's economic implications associated with um, derelict fishing gear, as well as habitat damage. When we get down to our consumer products, um, it becomes a little less clear of the known sources. Sure, things could be left by beachgoers. They could be due to mismanaged waste. Um, as well as a number of other sources. But if we imagine a plastic bottle, we don't really know exactly where it entered the ocean, unless we physically see someone littering it into the ocean. Um, so it could be like a plastic bottle that was tossed over a boat. It could be a plastic bottle that was left behind by a beachgoer, or it could be clear upstream, where say a plastic bottle was recycled correctly, but then a strong windstorm came, perhaps, um, uh, transported the plastic bottle into a small creek or stream, which made its way out into the ocean. So it gets tricky to kind of know the actual sources of where uh, this debris is coming from. Becomes even trickier when we get down to our microplastics and microfibers, because um, we're looking at small plastic pieces that we can't even identify, unless it's like those microbeads or, um, or fibers, but still determining actually where those items came from. Um, becomes rather tricky. Uh, the impacts are also a little less certain than um, the impacts for some of the larger debris. And in terms of understanding the impacts, we can, you know, we have a pretty good idea of the impacts to um, organisms from these other types of debris. We've seen photos of um, organisms um, entangled in debris or uh, that have ingested debris. But when we're looking at the impacts of microplastics, we're oftentimes looking at um, an individual organism or even smaller levels of organization within, so the tissues, the proteins, um, the organs of the actual organism. So kind of as we go down the table, um, we have less uncertainty about the known sources and the impacts. Um, there have been a few studies in the last couple of years that have shown physical impacts due to ingesting microplastics. Um, such as feeding modifications and reproduction disruptions. Um, we also have seen some studies that have shown that 
uh, organisms that ingest microplastics can also um, take up the contaminants or chemicals that were on the microplastics in their tissue. However, compared to the natural food sources of these animals, um, it seems that microplastics are also like, like a smaller portion of what they might be exposed to from their natural diet. So there's still a lot of work to be done in this area. Um, and we have a few studies that have actually looked at some of these um, questions that I'll go over today. So now we know what the issue is. Um, I'll go over briefly how we're addressing the issue at the NOAA Marine Program. So our program was established in 2006 as the federal lead for marine debris. And we function off of five program pillars. Uh, the first three pillars, research, removal, and prevention, we hold grant competitions to fund partners to um, conduct projects on these three topics. So I'll talk today about a number of research projects that we funded through grant competitions. I'll talk about, or no, I won't talk about, uh, but just mention now, um, we have removal projects that focus on the removal of derelict fishing gear, as well as derelict vessels. And then our program also has a huge focus on prevention. If we don't uh, stop the debris from getting into the ocean in the first place, this is going to be just kind of an ever-ending uh, cycle of debris getting into the ocean. We also have an emergency response pillar. And so this would be addressing events such as um, hurricanes and uh, superstorms, like Superstorm Sandy. Um, and so that's preparing for and then uh, also dealing with these emergency responses after these storms have um, blown through. And the last program pillar we have is regional coordination. So we have a small but mighty team, or I think just over 20 people. Um, half of us sit here in the mid-Atlantic, just outside of DC, and the other half of our staff are spread throughout the country. And there are eyes and ears on the ground for what's going on in their regions in terms of marine debris. And they're also a great resources for any folks interested in learning more about marine debris in your region, the projects we're funding, as well as just general information. If you want more information on what's going on in your area or who your regional coordinator is, you can go onto our website and we have that information uh, listed. Since the um, NOAA Marine Debris Program started in 2006, we have funded over 60 research projects um, that have been addressing fishing gear assessments and modifications, economic impacts, uh, shoreline monitoring, as well as a number of microplastic projects um, in the recent years. We partner with academia, NGOs, as well as other NOAA um, partners. So today I'm going to go over um, six different projects that we are funding. And since I'm going to be discussing quite a few projects, I'm going to kind of keep it high level. So just kind of the basics. If you have more questions about a specific project, I'd be happy to, to get in, into more depth in the question session. So here we have a map of the different locations and partners we funded for the six projects I'll be talking about. Um, realizing, though, that a lot of these projects do have national um, application. Okay. The first project I will talk about today is a project conducted by Dr. Robert Hale from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and his co-PI, Dr. Chen, from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And they were interested in um, analyzing a number of environmental conditions and seeing how that would affect the leaching of persistent bioaccumulative or toxic substances from microplastics or the absorption of contaminants to microplastics. So you can kind of see that in this figure up here. So plastics often have um, additives that are added, so chemicals added during the um, production process to give them specific um, characteristics such as flexibility or um, um, rigidness, whatever characteristic they're looking for for the plastic. And those, contam or those chemicals can actually leach from the plastics uh, once they're submerged in water. At the same time, we also have contaminants in the ocean that will readily absorb to the microplastic particle. And I'll also mention this photo here. It's one of my favorite photos. Um, this is a scanning electron microscope photo of polystyrene. 
uh, which is pretty neat. You can see all like the little ridges and um, kind of pits there that make this plastic have a large surface area, and um, so they can you know um, absorb lots of contaminants. Okay. So the objective of this study was to enhance our understanding of the chemical impacts of the persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances with respect to marine debris. Um, they looked at additive leaching as well as sorption experiments. And today I'm going to just focus on the leaching experiments. So we'll use this diagram down here to kind of explain how they set up this experiment. They looked at four different types of plastic. They looked at plastic characteristics like the, um, the particle size as well as weathering. And they also looked at a number of environmental conditions such as water temperature, salinity, dissolved organic matter, as well as a synthetic digestive fluid which should mimic um, the digestive fluid of an animal. So what they did is they added the plastics to this tube with sand and then they would run the uh, water reservoir of water with the different environmental conditions through the plastics and then collect the water at the other end and analyze it for um, the chemicals that leached. And this is what they found. Um, so I'll walk through the table just to orient you a little bit. We have our environmental conditions, the top ones here, as well as weathering, so plastic characteristic. And then we have the four different plastic types polyurethane foam, polystyrene, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and polyethylene. And they used a polyethylene regrind, which is a composite of recycled plastic bottles. For looking at the polyurethane foam, they found that um, this type of plastic leached flame retardants, and that with increasing temperatures, there was increased leaching. In the, pres in the presence of a synthetic digestive fluid, there was leaching, as well as with increased um, concentrations of dissolved organic matter. In looking at the weathering process, um, this type of plastic, saw, they saw a decrease in the surface area and also a decrease in the leaching. And they also saw a color change from the plastic due to the weathering process. For polystyrene, um, didn't see any, any leaching from the increased temperatures. They did see leaching from the presence of one of two synthetic digestive fluids. Um, again, no leaching from the dissolved organic matter, no change in surface area, no leaching due to weathering, and then they also saw a color change in um, the particle. For polyvinyl chloride, again, uh, no change with increased temperatures. They did see, again, um, leaching with the presence of one of the two synthetic digestive fluids. And they do, they noted that they do want to go back and make sure it's the actual particle that's leaching the contaminant or the chemical and not um, the actual synthetic digestive fluid that already somehow had the, the chemical in it. Um, again, nothing for the dissolved organic matter. They saw an increased surface area due to weathering, um, no change in leaching, and a color change in the particle. For the polyethylene, they really didn't see any effects or no leaching. Um, they did see a color change indicating weathering. Um, however, they're thinking that because they use these polyethylene regrinds, the recycled bottles, that perhaps during the pre-washing treatment um, that pulled out the additives, those chemicals. So by the time they use them in this study, there are no additives to leach. So something else to explore in the future. If we move on to our second project. Um, this project was conducted by Amy Zuda from the Sea Education Association. She's now at Eckerd College. Um, her co-PIs were Kara Lavender Law and Anthony Andrade from Helix Science. And they investigated the selective grazing of copepods of um, virgin and weathered microplastics contaminated with persistent by cumulative and toxic substances. Uh, the objective of their study was to determine if copepods graze indiscriminately on contaminated and uncontaminated particles. And they used um, low-density polyethylene, which is a common type of plastic found on the sea surface of the ocean. 
And they're interested in looking at this um, at copepods because in nature they're able to um, kind of distinguish and avoid eating contaminated um, or toxic algae. So they were interested in seeing if they could also identify and avoid eating the contaminated microplastic particles in this study. So the copepods were given one of four diets. First diet, just phytoplankton. The second diet, only uncontaminated microbeads. The third, contaminated microbeads. And the last, the mixed, the mixed diet of phytoplankton and the contaminated microplastic beads. They found that copepods do ingest the microplastics. Sometimes they um, preferentially ate the microplastics over the, um, the natural diet of algae, um, phytoplankton. And they found that there was no selective grazing behavior between the contaminated and uncontaminated microplastics. They ate both of them um, at a similar, um, similar rate. They also, so this means that either one, they're not able to detect the contaminant on the particles, or two, they're not able to selectively avoid eating those contaminated particles. They also found um, that the low-density polyethylene beads were actually clumping together. And they hadn't seen this before um, during experiments, so that's something they're interested in pursuing as well. Move on to our third project which was conducted by Chelsea Rockman and Dr. Ta from the University of California, Davis. They were interested in the ecotoxicological effects of microplastics and absorbed priority pollutants in aquatic food chains. The objective of this study was to test whether environmentally relevant concentrations of four different types of microplastics with or without PCBs, which are a type of priority pollutant, um, directly affected the prey or indirectly affected the predators um, of a freshwater food chain. So the prey that they used in this study were clams, and the predator is a white sturgeon, juvenile white sturgeon. And they looked at, again, four different types of plastic, so they're listed here, with and without the PCBs. They also had the control treatment, so just um, algae, and then algae with the contaminant, with PCBs. The clams were fed one of these 10 different treatments um, for 28 days. After the 28 days, the tissue was ground up and then incorporated into the diet of the sturgeon. And the sturgeon were fed this, one of these 10 diets, again, for 28 days. After that time, they did a feeding behavior study and then analyzed the um, clams and sturgeon uh, for the following. So we looked at bioaccumulation of PCBs in the clams and sturgeon, as well as impacts to the actual organism. And they looked at the proteins, tissues, and um, an organism. So in the tissue, they're looking for abnormalities or um, lesions in the tissue. And then at the organism level, they're looking at behavior change and then mortality. Um, now, Chelsea's group, are in, they're in the process of publishing um, their paper. It's in a, at a journal for review, so they've asked that we hold off on sharing the results so it doesn't hinder that process. Um, so hopefully, stay tuned for results from this project in the coming months. Okay, now you've heard me talk for a long time, so if you want to just take a little break and imagine yourself swimming in this beautiful photo. Um, with this sargasm up top, which is a floating habitat, habitat for many um, uh, juvenile fish, you might see some turtles swimming around. You might also see trash, which I, probably is not super surprising to people nowadays with it being pretty much everywhere. Um, so in this project, Dr. Frank Hernandez from University of Southern Mississippi um, was looking at um, the ingestion of microplastics by these fish that are associated with the, um, the sargasm mats. This project actually had a pretty pretty unique start. Um, it, Dr. Hernandez wasn't actually interested in the microplastics component of this project when, um, when it got going. Um, instead, he was out doing surveys for the Deepwater Horizon, so looking at the sargasm mats to see if there were any effects from the oil spill. And in, when they went out and collected these sargasm patches, they found lots of debris embedded with the sargasm. Um, 
so that spurred the idea to, to kind of start this study. Sargassum and micro or marine debris and microplastics um, are all influenced by many of the same oceanographic processes, such as the winds and the currents. Um, so they're accumulating in some of those frontal zones. So it makes sense that they're um, both in the same area, found in the same area. So the objectives of this study was to characterize the juvenile fish assemblages that are co-occurring with the debris in these sargassum maps, as well as determine how many of the fish that they collected um, had actually ingested microplastic particles. So you can see in the photos here, they are collecting the um, sargassum, washing it, and then collecting all of the fish from, from the samples that they collected. They dissected 860 fish. From those fish, um, they found 34 taxonomic groups. Of those 34 groups, 15 had contained um, microplastics in their stomachs, and um, jacks were the most common um, type of fish with or group with microplastics in their stomachs. Um, and the specific fish that had the most microplastics in their stomach were um, filefish, sergeant major, Bermuda chub, and the triple tail. About 10% of the fish that they collected contained microplastics in their stomach, and any given fish that had ingested microplastic had a range of one to seven items that it had ingested. The most common type of, um, of debris ingested were fibers but they also looked for spheres, flakes, and fragments. And they didn't, um, they didn't identify the composition of the polymer types. So um, this could be, again, natural, um, like cotton fibers, or it could be synthetic fibers. Uh, in this photo up here, this fiber was, or fibers were eaten by an amberjack. And then down here, this fragment was eaten by a Bermuda chub. Okay, we'll move on to the next project. This is a project being conducted by Dr. Stephanie Whitmire from Clemson University, as well as the Park Service. Um, and they were interested in quantifying microplastics and microfiber loads on U.S. national park beaches. So we've kind of switched from looking at water samples or um, debris in organisms to debris on, um, on the beaches now. So again, the objective here was to quantify microplastics and microfiber loads on beaches at a regional and continental scale to better understand their distribution. And they, um, they also took into account general geography as well as currents when considering the distribution of these, um, these particles. So they sampled 37 different beaches, and those are all the um, light purple dots on the screen. And, um, this represented 35 different national parks, um, monuments, seashores, and recreational areas. You'll notice that there aren't any samples in the southeast or the Gulf of Mexico. Um, that's because they've already sampled these areas in a previous study, in a previous effort, and that report is actually out. Um, it was completed last year. Um, I think you can probably find it on the Park Service site. Preliminary results from this project indicate that microplastics and microfibers um, were found at all of the different sites, so all 37 sites, including remote sites up in Alaska and American Samoa. And microfibers were the most dominant debris type found. So this project uh, just demonstrates the ubiquitous nature of microplastics and microfibers, um, even in those remote places. Okay, finally, we've gotten to our last project. Um, so this project is being conducted by Dr. Jeremy Kunkel from Texas A&M University. And his co-PIs are Elizabeth Hassenmuller, Lisa Chambers, and John White. And they're um, quantifying and characterizing microplastic debris loads in the Mississippi River. Okay. So in this project, they're interested in quantifying microplastics, uh, microplastic loads throughout the Mississippi River to assess loading to the Gulf of Mexico. So they're interested in looking at um, 
Samples above and below major where major tributaries enter the Mississippi River. So they sampled 11 sites, or should say they are going to sample 11 sites, um, starting in Illinois and working all the way down to Louisiana. So you can see here, we've got, um, say, one sample above where the, Miss, uh, where the Illinois River enters the Mississippi River, as well as below. So they want to look at the loads of these microplastics coming in from the tributaries, as well as loads then going from the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico. They're collecting water samples from the surface of the river, as well as in the water column. And due to the high sediment loads, um, as well as variable flow rates, they're actually using a pump to collect the samples rather than um, nets, which were generally have been used to collect microplastics from the surface. Um, they also are anticipating that they'll have to do additional um, filtering once they get into the lab due to, again, those high sedimentation loads. So they've created a filtering apparatus that will further filter their samples. So in each of these elbows, there is a different um, filter size, so they'll be able to filter out the particles by, um, by the different sizes. Again, this is an ongoing project. They'll conduct their first sampling in early May, and then they'll conduct a second sampling in late summer. If you're interested in learning more about any of the projects I've just mentioned today, you can go to our website and check out our current efforts tab, um, and then just click on research. And we have project profiles for all the projects I've mentioned, as well as other projects that we have funded. I wanted to circle back to this uh, what we know and what we're still figuring out table, um, and just kind of briefly review how the projects that we've funded um, how they fit in with other microplastics literature that's out there, and then talk a little bit about the data gaps. So if we review the um, studies that looked at abundance and distribution, we're finding that uh, microplastics and microfibers are ubiquitous on U.S. beaches and in the environment, uh, even remote, hard to get to places. And microfibers were the most frequently found debris type on those national park beaches as well as in the guts of sargassum-associated fish, and that is similar to other findings of um, scientists looking at the uh, contents of microfibers and microdebris in stomachs. They're finding a lot of microfibers in the U.S. Um, if we look at the chemical and microplastic interaction, we saw that copepods ate both contaminated and uncontaminated particles. There's no selective grazing behavior. Um, and chemicals do leach from the microplastic particles, and the root leaching depends on the plastic polymer, the temperature of the water, the concentration of the dissolved organic matter, um, and that the increased water temperature and dissolved organic matter um, had some of the greatest effects on leaching. If we look at data gaps in the field, um, we often see that Microplastic studies are occurring in a laboratory setting. Um, not many have actually looked at field studies. So how those results from a laboratory where you're able to control um, most of the, you know, the conditions besides the variable you're, you're testing, um, how that relates to actual field studies, um, there's definitely a data gap in that area. In the field, organisms are likely exposed to many other stressors. Um, they might be exposed to different types of plastic, um, might be exposed to other contaminants. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns about how those laboratory studies actually um, translate into what's going on in the field. A lot of the laboratory studies are also looking at um, higher concentrations of microplastics than are found in um, different compartments, such as the sediment or the water column. Um, so using environmentally relevant concentrations of the microplastics or contaminants is also a data gap. And in some cases, we just don't know what those environmentally relevant concentrations are, which is, again, another data gap. Um, and lastly, um, there's, we're starting to understand what's going on to individual organisms, but what's actually happening up at populations and community levels, that's also um, not really well known and not well studied. So keeping those data gaps in mind, 
last fall, our program um, held a research competition with the following three priorities. Um, the first was to conduct an ecological risk assessment. So this is looking um, kind of at the bigger pictures of um, what is actually happening at, you know, maybe say to individuals, yes, but more so at populations and communities. Um, it's also, risk assessments will also help us identify data gaps that we might not even be considering at this time. We also had a priority of exposure studies, so looking at um, what are the environmental, well, environmentally relevant concentrations of microplastics in different um, compartments, again like sediments or the water, um, etc. And we're also interested in looking at what, at what concentrations do we start to see effects to organisms. So including that environmentally relevant concentration but also looking at concentration, concentrations above and below and seeing the impacts to organisms at those levels. And these exposure studies can then eventually be fit into an ecological risk assessment. Uh, the final priority we had uh, was looking at bait and transport of marine debris in nearshore coastal environments. Um, so for this priority, we're trying to determine where debris goes once it enters the marine environment or Great Lakes. Um, so if it's entering from a river, if it's entering from the beach, the high tide pulls debris out into the ocean. Is it going out into the ocean and sinking? Is it traveling along the coast and maybe either sinking or getting beached again? Um, or is it being transported out into the open ocean? We're trying to better understand what's happening to the debris once it, once it enters the marine or Great Lakes environments. So again, the competition for this research grant call was held last fall. Um, we're still in the selection process, um, but more information to come in probably a couple of months. And if you're excited about marine debris, you might want to attend the 6th International Marine Debris Conference, which will be held March 12th through 16th um, next year in San Diego, California. And we currently have a call for technical sessions that's open. So if you're interested in hosting um, a session, please make sure to submit your abstract by Friday, June 2nd. Um, and I'd like to point out that there is a specific topic area for microplastics and microfibers, as well as many other areas in um, research, education, removal, other topics in marine debris as well. If you think a technical session might be too much of a load, um, you can also submit a paper or abstract um, for a poster, and the call for those will be in mid-July. If you want to learn more about the conference, you can either go to the website listed here, um, or you can sign up to get um, updates at this site. Okay. Lastly, I know that marine debris can kind of be a doom and gloom subject. Um, so I kind of wanted to leave on a positive note and just highlight some things that you can do um, in your own lives to help um, maybe address the marine debris issue. So you probably heard the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, I like to think of it in a different order, recycle, reduce, and reuse. Um, so we have a listed a website here. You can go and see um, what recycling options are available in your area. So click on, you know, go to that website, type in your zip code, and it'll pop up with a list of recycling um, um, locations in your area, as well as what can and can't be recycled. So recycle what you can. I try to reduce what items can't be recycled. Um, and if I can't reduce them, then then learn how to reuse or repurpose those materials into other items. It's also almost Earth Day, so you could join a cleanup. Um, if, you, uh, if you aren't near a cleanup, you can also use the Marine Debris Tracker app and do your own, where you go out and just collect items and just track those items on this uh, Marine Debris Tracker app. And then also, um, can be a selective consumer. You're the one buying different products, so if you want to avoid um, some of those single-use plastic items or plastic packaging, um, you have the power to do that. Um, I know for myself personally, I've gone from, um, after learning um, with recycling, cardboard is one of the best materials to be recycled. Um, I've switched from using a plastic soap, plastic 
soap in a plastic bottle to soap in a cardboard box that can be recycled. So you can make lots of different um, little changes in your life to maybe help with this issue, depending on what you're comfortable with. Okay, with that, I'll take any questions. All right, well, you've given us a lot to think about, so thanks for that great presentation. And uh, I think I'd like to start with a couple of general questions. Are there some types of plastics that are worse than others in terms of their impacts on wildlife? Um, it, you know, honestly, it probably depends on what organism is interacting with the plastic. So if an organism in, is ingesting it, it would depend on um, the, the organism in question, what they're ingesting, how big the particle is, if is it, is it going to like um, kind of fill up the organism's stomach, is it going, is it sharp, is it going to cut, a, you know, a, a hole in its stomach's lining. Um, so it just depends on kind of a base-by-base -base situation. Um, it also depends on if an organism can pass the the debris through its system. If it can pass it through, there might not be any effect. Um, so to say one plastic is more um, harmful than others, I think we need to think about it in, in what context and what is it impacting. So okay, not thanks. Quite as, not quite as easy as we might think. And Carly, you talk about um, microfibers and microplastics, just kind of to talk about terminology here for a moment. Do you consider microfibers to be a type of microplastic, or are they considered to be their own category of contaminant? That's a good question. Um, so microfibers are often clumped in with microplastics, but unless folks are actually um, using different processes like um, FTIR or Roman um, spectroscopy to actually identify the composition of those um, materials. Um, I like to kind of separate them because we don't necessarily know that a fiber is um, plastic compared to, say, cotton. Well, and actually that leads to another question that someone submitted. Um, are natural fibers like cotton a concern, and how quickly do they break down? Another great question, and unfortunately I don't really think we know much about that. Um, we know that they're ingesting the particles, but I've not seen any studies um, that have looked at natural fibers to see if they have, you know, the same impacts as the synthetic fibers. Um, so I think that's definitely an area of research that could be explored further. And I know you, you pointed people to your website to learn more about the research that NOAA is funding, and so I, I would recommend that to all the listeners who are, want more information about the research. But I'm wondering, obviously there's a lot of research going on outside what NOAA is funding. Is there a good source to visit to learn more about um, other types of research going on in marine debris? Yes, but if I can think of them on the top of my head. Um, I know there's a database with um, marine debris that just came out, but unfortunately it's escaping my mind of what, litter base? litter base, I'm told. Um, so I think that would be a good place to start looking at um, what other people are finding in terms of marine debris. Okay, great. Um, here's a question from Ryan Hlikowski, who's doing research on microplastics in a tidal freshwater wetland in DC, and he has collected and analyzed the symptom, the samples, excuse me, um, but is asking, do you have suggestions about what types of analysis would be useful to do um, on this data? Um, he has, you know, kind of collected how much is there, but um, he's, he's looking for input on what kind of analysis would be helpful. Um, honestly, without knowing more about what he's doing, um, I, I guess I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. Um, so if you want to email me, Ryan, maybe we can you know, talk a little bit more and I can give you more information, but um, yeah, I think I'd like more information before I just jump into an answer. Okay, thanks for that. And I will say, um, we are going to post this presentation on the MPA Center website and the recording of the webinar on the Open Channels website. So if anyone wants to go back and look at it more carefully, that will be available. And then, um, Carly, we will go ahead and connect you with the the list of folks who, uh, who participated in case people do have some specific questions. Great, thank you.
So here are some sort of more higher level uh, questions about partnerships and budgets. Um, are there any concerns about um, cuts to the program based on the priorities of the new administration? Um, I can't speak to that actually, um, partly because I just don't know. Um, and I think we'll know more probably by the end of the month when the current continuing resolution um, is set to expire. But at this time, I just don't really know. Okay. And another question has to do with um, some partners. Uh, the UN Environment Program, Regional Seas, has been working on marine debris issues. Just wondering if you've been working with them? Yes. In fact, we're co-organizing the 6th International Marine Debris Conference with them, so we do quite a bit of work with them. Okay, great. And is there... Um, I'm just looking at this other question, actually. I think it's you've pretty much answered it about UNEP. So here is a, a question from Clean Water Action asking, is the regional loading report available online? And this was the one about um, photo degradation and that it, it is not as widely observed in all types of plastics. So someone looking for a little bit more information about that study. Um, I'm not sure which study you're referring to. I think it was the, the first one that you described. The first one. Um, there's, I think, um, Dr. Andrade has done some research on um, the breakdown of plastics, so that might be a source. Um, but the final, in terms of the, like the final report of that project, no, it's not online. But I can also get you and uh, you know the, the person in contact with the PI from the project if they have additional questions. Um, okay, great. And you talked a little bit about wildlife impacts, but have, have there been any research that you're aware of about human health impacts of marine debris, or microplastics? Um, I know there's interest in the issue, but um, it's also kind of a tricky um, subject to study. So I think there's a lot of interest and we'll see some studies moving forward. Um, but as of yet, I really haven't seen many studies looking at the human health component. Um, I will throw out there, though, if you eat table salt, you could be ingesting microplastics. Fun fact of the day. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about that, the, where the source of table salt and how that's happening? Um, well, table salt um, from like sea salt, a study found, I think it was in was it China, um, that uh, sea salts had microplastic particles in them, which it totally makes sense if it's coming from the ocean, um, that those particles would be there. And I just recently saw another paper that came out, I think within the last couple of weeks, I haven't had a chance to to read it, but this, I, it looks like they're comparing different types of sea salts from, um, I don't know, different companies or different types of, of sea salts, so definitely something to check out. Okay, uh, this gets into the more specific question about the RFP that's out right now for, uh, for marine debris research and had mentioned that uh, awards were going to be announced in May 2017 and wondering if that is still on track. Um, I don't know if we ever announced May 2017. Usually it's not until later. Um, we don't get final approval from the Grants Management Office at NOAA until later in the summer. So I wouldn't say we, I would expect like um, the final list of projects that are selected um, towards late summer. Okay. Um, do you want to comment on plastic straws? I realize that's a little bit outside the, the focus of microplastics, but I know that straws are getting a lot of attention in terms of wildlife impacts. Sure, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is, how big of an issue are plastic straws? Oh, huh. Well, I don't have specific numbers in front of me, but I think it's one of the top items found in the Ocean, uh, Ocean Conservancy's International Coastal Cleanup. Um, so it's definitely a report people could go and look at to see how many straws are being found. Um, and I would encourage you, if you go to a restaurant, to ask for no straw when you order a drink. Um, it's kind of tricky to remember to do, but when you do it, you feel awesome. <laughs> no, that's good, good advice. Uh, okay, uh, someone asking, Sarah Murray is asking, can you describe the reproduction disruptions that were found in the lab study that you referenced? So that was a study, um, not that we funded, but um, a study looking at um, oysters and um, 
And I think they saw, that was um, Susarello. I might not be saying the name of the main author um, correctly, but that was a study looking at um, polystyrene ingestion by oysters, and they found um, that the, um, there were changes in the genes transcription, as well as potentially decreased fertility, um, decreased, I think, egg production, um, smaller eggs, and, um, and less mobile sperm. So um, if you want more information, definitely check out that paper. And if I can, um, if that person gets in contact with me, I can send them cita the citation for it. OK, great. Um, and then uh, there's also a question from Matt Miller about uh, recent studies that talked about the microplastics from car tires. Uh, can you comment on that or provide any additional information? Only that I've also recently looked into it myself. Um, and it's kind of fascinating. Um, but it's, I'm not, it's a certain part of the tire, like inside the tire. Um, I'm completely blanking right now. Um, but that I think they also found it's potentially a small contribute, um, contribution of microplastics to the marine environment. And they would get into the environment via runoff. Um, but if you just do some Googling, um, you can find some more information. That's, that's kind of how I learned about um, the issue myself. So I'm no expert on tires by any means. So there were, um, there's also a question from Sydney Harris who asks about um, whether NOAA or our partner organizations are investigating microplastics in uh, the wastewater treatment process. Um, we specifically aren't investigating wastewater treatment pro um, processes, um, but there's a lot of other organizations that are. Um, USGS think they're doing some studies with wastewater treatment plants. And um, there's a lot of other researchers in the Great Lakes and um, I think even in um, Charleston as well as out on the West Coast in um, the San Francisco Bay Area that are looking at wastewater treatment plants. Okay, great. Um, I will say that a lot of these questions may be a little bit outside your scope, Carly. There's a lot of interest in educating people about marine debris and also policy initiatives to try to um, reduce marine debris in the in the first place through, um, you know, upstream or in the, in the materials process, reducing waste. Um, I don't know if, if you want to comment on that or have resources available that you might want to point people to. We definitely have resources for the education. Um, you can go to our website and we have a um, resources tab and there's different activity books, um, lesson plans, and lots of other materials uh, that folks can find um, regarding the education uh, in terms of, uh, and they're free. Yeah, you can download and have them for free. Um, in terms of the policy, I'm going to stay away from that. We are a, um, we are not the policy portion of NOAA, so we tend to provide the science that, that policy and decision makers use for policies, but can't really touch on that. Okay, and I do want to say that uh, a couple people mentioned the International Coastal Cleanup, which is a great resource for marine debris monitoring and also cleanup efforts. So I, I would suggest that people also take a look at that. Yes, and I will also say we just had a blog that came out recently. If you are interested in doing a cleanup on Earth Day um, with locations around the country where folks can go and join the cleanup. So if you go to our website, um, bottom of the page, there's a link to the blogs, and you can find it there. Or you Great. can join our newsletter and also have them year-round. That's great. And um, there's a, there is another question about, um, is there work going on in terms of technology and uh, research to um, collect microfibers and prevent them from entering the stream, like while doing laundry? Yeah, there's a number of um, uh, technologies that are occurring. Um, there was a microfiber webinar that um, the, I think the EPA Trash Free Waters um, program just, um, they had a webinar in March. So that video is available where you can learn about the specific um, 
the specific technologies. There's um, a rose or no a coral coral ball that's being created by the Roselia project, um, as well as is it the guppy bag, guppy friend bag um, that's being created by um, two guys from uh, Europe somewhere. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not. I don't know the specific area, but again, if you go and see that uh, webinar or. or or Google Guppy Friend, you'll you'll find more information. Okay, great. And I know there are several people who've asked about research on microplastics and and what or and microfibers in particular. Uh, but just getting back to the broader topic of micro microplastics, is there research going on about how to remove microplastics from the marine environment? Is there any way to do that? Um, well, it's. It would honestly be very time consuming and expensive to remove tiny, tiny fragments from the ocean. Um, so for our program, we're focusing more on preventing debris from getting into the ocean in the first place. Um, that's a better use of our, of our resources, um, especially too, like uh, I showed that table of all those debris items from derelict vessels down to the microfibers, and if we're capturing and getting the larger debris items out of the water or potentially saving like millions of microplastics that are then being created. So our, our focus is on targeting some of the larger debris um, that's just more manageable for, for our program. Is there any work being done that you're aware of on how fish and other organisms may be adapting to plastics in the ocean? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if I've read any, but if anyone knows of them, send them my way. I'd love to, love to um, take a look at that, but um, that's an interesting question. Okay, um, and a couple of people have shared some websites, so that's great. I appreciate it. Um, we mentioned Litterbase earlier. It suggests that people take a look at that. It's litterbase.awi.de. And then also NIH has some resources on micro, microplastics, um, www.toxtown.nlm.nih.gov. So I, I refer you to those, some other resources for you. Um, here's a question from Dorothy Horn, who's been involved in a microplastic study in California, asking, is there a, are there sources of funding to help with projects in terms of getting the next generation of students involved in this issue? Oh, students. Um, well, I would have said back in the fall, check out our research grant competition, um, but um, that's already closed. In terms of other sources of funding, um, I mean, I check maybe like local sea grant offices, see if they have any um, calls for proposals for um, just different topics. Um, I'm, I'm blanking. I'm not. That's okay. Other ones right now. Carly, uh, you know, since there is so much interest in um, schools and getting people engaged and helping people understand this issue, I wonder if uh, your office or other partners that you know of have gotten involved in citizen science around marine debris and microplastics in particular. Yeah. So we have we have um, a couple different programs actually. The um, Marine Debris Tracker app is a great citizen science tool. Um, you can use that for collecting debris on your own. Um, we're also seeing um, some schools using the app to collect data around their, their school campus and then taking the results from what they're finding to like local, um, like the school board um, to try to get you know, increased trash bins or recycling containers put around their campuses. Um, we also have a shoreline monitoring program um, that's a citizen science program and we just recently have um, a toolkit for educators um, for our shoreline monitoring program um, to kind of walk them through the steps of how they would complete such a program with students and that's not quite on our website yet but um, it should be coming out soon so if there's interest just stay tuned um, will probably be a blog or some sort of social media around its release. Great. I, I will say there, there's been some great sharing on the question stream about other resources. 
tremendous amount of interest in this uh, in this topic. Uh, someone, Andy Collins, has also mentioned there's a water strider study on oceans and adaptation to plastics. Uh, it looks like you could probably find it by Googling uh, Scripps study on uh, on marine debris. So I, I offer that up. Uh, and perhaps we can find a way to share that with you. I'm not going to read the whole long URL. Uh, but overall, I would just say that uh, I think there's, there's a great interest in this topic. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest in reducing marine debris. We've talked today mostly about the research, but uh, I know that both NOAA um, and EPA do a lot of education on helping people understand uh, ways to reduce plastic pollution. So, Carly, I know we need to wrap up, but I just wanted to give you the last word if there's anything you'd like to say in closing. Oh, boy. Um, well, I guess thanks for listening. And, um, you know, just try to keep maybe marine debris in your mind when you um, go to the beach next time. I always, when I leave a beach or leave a park, I try to pick up five pieces of item, five pieces of trash each time um, to kind of do my part. So maybe if everyone kind of pitches in and thinks about that the next time they go for a walk or go to the beach, we might have a slightly cleaner environment. All right. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Uh, really appreciate all your questions. And we'll do our best to continue sharing information on this topic. Thank you.